everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the watches that are way up there, and, but people don't know them as well. And even though they're excellent watches, uh, both strong and high horology watches, and one is what is usually considered elite horology. Um, we're going to take a look at those and see how we can get some that are affordable. And uh, so we'll do that next. But first, we're going to take a look at Amintis Nitto's Patek Philippe Annual Calendar Chronograph. <laughs> this this watch is so beautiful and such an incredible watch uh, and what it does this is this is a wonderful example of high horology uh, in its in its best form and the uh, first of all the design with the day of the week the uh, the date and then the month uh, at the top in a little half circle at the top and then the time around it and then the sub dial it's it's just a beautifully designed watch and then it has the um uh the buttons for uh the chronograph so this is uh this is really uh a very cool watch and especially with the chronograph in the middle uh like that i mean the dial for the chronograph as opposed to usually they have them off to different sides and stuff this this watch is just incredible i don't want to embarrass anybody, but these are really expensive watches. I mean, this thing is, I whoa, even um, pre-owned, these things are very dear watches, and for a good reason. They're just they're just beautiful, and they they really are a, a feat of horological magic. Anyhow, uh, thank you so much, uh, Amidas, for uh, letting us uh, show this watch. I am. I was very impressed by it, and I think that um, our subscribers will be too. Okay, let's get to work now on trying to find a very high horology watch for a reasonable amount. Okay, uh, what I'm going to start with is sort of a overview of the different kinds of tools that we have, if you want to call them that. Um, first of all, when, when we're looking at a watch, we, it's not a bad idea to know something <clears throat> about the group that it's in, or whether it's independent. And uh, for example, one of the watches we're going to look at is uh, Louis Vuitton, and it's part of the Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton group, which is called LVMH. I have no idea why they switched it around like that, but they did. And um, they include Bulgarian. By the way, the numbers and parentheses are the number of Grand Prix awards they've won. Uh, the Charlie Umet, uh, Dior, Fred, I, I don't know what Fred is, uh, Hublot. They've won five uh, Grand Prix. Uh, Louis Vuitton uh, has not won any, but I think they will. Uh, Tag Heuer has won eight uh, Grand Prix, including one for the uh, Aiguille d'Or, uh, or Aiguille d'Or. Uh, so that's really something. And then there's uh, Zenus that has six wins. So, I mean, this is a, a pretty impressive group. Okay, so that's one thing. You want to sort of get an idea of the group that one's in, or whether it's an independent, it's not part of a group. All right, now, uh, what I did is uh as you can see, I, I put the number of wins for the Grand Prix. That's something I think you should use for a uh, criteria. If a watch has won a Grand Prix award or has uh, been pre-selected, which means it's one of the top uh, groups, that's, that's saying that a bunch of really smart people have chosen it. Now, there's a, a place uh, called uh, watchrankings.com. Uh, Watch-rankings.com. They call themselves the definitive ranking. Okay, well... Um, some of you may take issue with that, and you'd probably be right. But anyway, what they've done, they have uh, five categories. Um, 
uh, once called the very top is called ultra luxury and they get five stars for that. The high end luxury has four stars. Luxury, luxury has three stars. Basic luxury has two and entry luxury has one. Um, some of these watches, I mean, it's, it's a real stretch <laughs> to talk about them as luxury. What does luxury really mean? Um, and we had been working on the, uh, uh, the watch uh, art side. I, I tried to set up, and with a lot of help from, from you guys, uh, a collector's rating. Because all of the other ratings I mean, are seem to be from the point of view of the people trying to sell you something. And we came up, well, originally we had three categories. Uh, there was strong horology where you had a good, solid uh, movement uh, like Rolex and Zenith. Then you had high horology and you have watches like Vacheron Constantine and Patek Philippe, like the one we just saw. And then there's exceptional horology. And these are, are watches by people like um, Kari Ulantanen, uh, uh, Philippe Dior, F Philippe Dior, Philippe Dufour, <laughs> uh, and um, F.P. Jorn. These guys, I mean, there's there's a real difference there. Uh, and there's some other ones, too. And these are the three high, uh, people who are really doing something about horology or watches that uh, reflect that. Now, I added another one at the bottom called standard horology. And basically, these are, <coughs> excuse me, these are mechanical watches, and uh, they'll have, all kinds of different movements in them, but they're they're not exactly a strong horology. They're but they work. I mean, uh, your ETAs, uh, Soprods, uh, those kinds of things are that kind of movement. Now, uh, independent movements like Agenhor uh, belong there. They belong up with the exceptional horology, and Vosser is probably well both high horology and exceptional horology. Those are some independents who do some some really incredible things. So with these tools as a background, let's uh, take a look at uh, some deals that I, I think I found uh, for everyone. Okay, uh, the first one we're going to take a look at is uh, Louis Vuitton. And uh, Louis Vuitton is that we think of it so much as a a brand that is for like a designer watch, not a real watch watch. Well, they're, they're trying to change that around. Now, the ones we're gonna look at, we're gonna start with the Louis Vuitton tambour. Tambour means drum and it's this great big fat watch. Actually, I sort of like it. <laughs> uh, and now Louis Vuitton is rated three stars by the um, uh, watch rankings. And the, the other one, and the, now this came out in a white paper not long ago. Now the white paper's been around and everybody sort of seems to know it, but I think the final one came around. And um, Louis Vuitton was in what they call the luxury category. Now what, what the luxury category of watches were, were watches that had a, a broad spectrum of luxury things, not just watches. And, and that makes sense. But they also had to be what the foundation of high horology felt was fine watchmaking and he did make the cut on that and that's very important and now from our viewpoint i mean when i say our mind from the collector's viewpoint um the i, I put it in the standard category and the reason it's standard it's it's uh ticking on an uh, eta uh, 2892-a2 uh it is louis vuitton it's got a very nice dial and case to it and you know the the uh, ETA 2892A2 is, is just a standard solid <laughs> movement. Um, this one was pre-owned for uh, $2,000. So having something from that category, if that's important to you, you, you can find some, some pretty good deals. Now, the what they did next, um, they, they've really, really made some important moves. And this is important to understand. And the watch ranking 
uh, folks, I think, are a little behind the curve on this. <laughs> they gave them three stars. They're probably, with watches like this, move up into something better. Uh, for From the collector's point of view, I think they belong in high horology. Um, now, this particular watch uh, was pre-selected in the uh, Grand Prix. What that means, everybody sends in their watches, and then they pre-select a few, and then one wins. Now, this one didn't win. Uh, but it was it it wasn't because he didn't really do a lot for it. Now, the, the dial on this watch was a very controversial. I mean, I, and by including people at Louis Vuitton, says, "Oh my God, nobody can look at that." But and I felt the same way. I said, "Oh, gee, you know, what would you wear that with a clown outfit?" I, you know, it was not so. But it grew on me. The more I looked at that thing. Say, you know, this is really cool, you know, and you know, if you go on vacation and you're traveling, like I like to go on cruises, and um, uh, last summer my wife and I went up to, to the Scandinavia and the Baltic states and Russia, and yeah, we went through several time zones, it's sort of cool to have something like that, and it's very interesting. The original ones were like hand painted, and they cost $70,000, so I think they thought, well, but probably not the best idea. Now, here's the other thing about uh, Louis Vuitton that's extremely important. They bought this movement call company uh, called La Fabrique du Temps. And the, the important thing is it isn't just, you know, you, anybody can go out and buy a factory, I guess, a, a watch factory. But what they got with it that came with this deal were two really outstanding watchmakers. One was Michael Navas and the other was Enrico Barbassini. They developed the double spiral tourbillon for Laurent Ferrier. So they're going into a very interesting place. Now, a brand new watch at $7,700 that, like I said, I it definitely to me, this has moved into high horology. Um, here's my hunch. Uh, I saw one used and they just, it was like 6,500 or something like that. I, I think they may have a hard time moving that. It's going to be a while before people catch up and catch on to the value of these things. And I think what's going to happen, uh, and especially this particular model, is they're going to drop like a rock. Now, I may be wrong. I may be wrong. But they, I, I suppose there are different philosophies. People worry a lot. Well, if I buy this, uh, what's the resale value? Well, in, in some watches, the resale value is not very good from new. So if you buy something new and maybe you get 50% of what you what you spent on it. Okay, you buy a $10,000 watch, you get $5,000 back. Um, the ones that keep their value more are Patek Philippe and um, Rolex. But uh, once the drop has occurred, and it's a big drop oftentimes, you can pick those up get those, and they don't drop anymore. They've already hit the bottom, so to speak. And th this is the way I like to look at it. Look for watches that are good watches, but people don't realize that they're good watches. And when they're when they're sold, and they down goes the price significantly, that's the time to get them. Because they're, they're probably not going to go down much more than that. And this is one. I like this watch. And... Um, Anyhow, I'm tempted by so many watches. I'm, <laughs> it's sort of crazy. Okay, um, now let's go from the a luxury category by the Foundation of High Horology to what's called um, historic Maçons. Now, these are on different levels too. The Beauvais, or Beauvais Fleurier, this company, it goes way back, <laughs> they, I think it's 1792, when their, when the first Beauvais who started the company was born. And so it, it goes back to the uh, 18th century, but not really. It's, it more was like a 19th century, it started in the 1800s. Okay, now, here's the thing about this watch. Um, First of all, there was a guy named Pascal Raffi who became the owner and uh, sole shareholder. Okay, he's, he's been owned by other people of Beauvais Florier SA. This is back in 2001, so this is like 16 years ago. 
and he, he, he moved the operation uh, to the castle of Montiers and purchased a movement company called Demer. Uh, it was it was called Demer 1738. It's a manufacturer of high haute horlogerie, artisan lal, and Beauvais 1822. This is back in uh, 2006, about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. Okay, and um, so this is one of their watches. Now, they have the, what I, I suppose they're entry level watches, really, for the kind of prices they have. Uh, this one's called the 1930, and they have the number 19 and the word 30. Sometimes they just put 1930 in, in all numbers. And this is called the uh, Beauvais 1930 de Mier, $19,300, new, okay? Um, and it has an in-house caliber of 15B M04, it's got, uh, runs at uh, 20, uh, 21,600 vibrations per hour. It's got a seven day power reserve. And everything about this thing is magnificent. Okay, and an entry price, I know it sounds nuts, because I, I, most of their other watches are north of $50,000. But they have one that's called the Beauvais 1930 Fleurier. And it, they're strange looking watches. Uh, I mean, everyone's heard of Beauvais, but nobody knows anything about them. <laughs> and one of the, uh, they're small for one reason. Uh, the other reason is, is that they make these unusual watches that probably don't have the biggest audience. And these are, uh, these are watches, and this, you can see this in the uh, 1930 Fleurier uh, models. They're, they look like uh, pocket watches that have been put on straps. Well, that's what they are. And the idea is, is that, well, if you don't want it on the strap and you want to wear it as a pocket watch, you can do it. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> you know, but it it's, doesn't exactly excite a lot of people. And this is one of the later ones. Now, the, um, the uh, 1930 Fleurier starts off at $11,000. And I know that's something, you know, that's crazy price. I can't afford that. Okay. But still, I mean, these are like tippity tippity top watches that are at the, at the top of the uh, top of the deck. Um, okay. So, uh, th this one, I put it in high horology, not the exceptional horology because it's quite meets the criteria for high horology, but not, uh, not exceptional. Like if you put in a Remontois uh, the Egalité in a watch, now that's exceptional because there aren't very many watches. Um, tourbillons, and <laughs> I don't know, there's so many of those. Okay, so let's go find one we can afford, all right? So I went looking and I found one, I found one on eBay for $800, a vintage one. But I, you know, it's this place, both is so cool. Uh, they have a, a place called Chateau de Motier, or the Motier Castle. And you can see the, in the picture, the guys over on the uh, right there, they're working away in, in, this, in this top of this gorgeous chateau. I mean, who's got, you know, most of those, the places where people are making watches look, you know, fairly Bauhaus. Uh, this is anything but. And imagine making watches in this kind of environment. It just it just blows my mind. Okay, so I found one, a very interesting one. It's a vintage mono pusher Rodaponte chronograph. Now this is from the 1940s, and it was uh, for sale on on uh, Chrono 24 for 42.50. Okay. Here's the thing about this watch that's so cool. It's condition zero. Apparently, it had been laying in some corner somewhere and in a watch store or warehouse or somewhere and um this watch company in boston found it <laughs> and so there's a uh a, a this this incredible beauvais watch for forty two hundred dollars now these are the kinds of things that are worth looking for okay now i, I the uh, chronograph, um, well, a mono pusher Rataponte uh, chronograph is is a, you know, that's that's really a major 
uh, feet, and in 1940s, it was all mechanical. <laughs> there was, it was nothing there. They all just throw in a, a part with all of, all of that there. This is a cool watch, but this is the kind of thing that instead of you know getting something with an ETA in it, you can get something with a, a really interesting watch if you're going to pay that kind of money anyway. Okay. Uh, let's go on. Uh, now, this next one is uh, Chopard. Chopard is one that you've got to be careful with, but there are some wonderful buys, and it's really a very well-respected uh, company. Uh, the uh, foundation of Haute Orology considered a historic Masson, and... Uh, the Grand Prix, they've done a bang-up job in the Grand Prix. I mean, the, the brand has, Chopard. Now, this particular one has what you'll see is it'll, it'll they usually say a Valgrangis A07-161. It, it is owned by ETA. Now, there are a lot of different things that ETA owns. And, um, uh, for example, uh, there's a long history of El Ra and... Uh, Pazu. Okay, well, at some point, Pazu was bought by ETA, and so the, uh, what was that? I think the Pazu called it the 7001, and ETA renamed it the uh, uh, ETA 7001. It, it, it's still not quite the same as an in-house movement. Now, here's the good news, and and how to go looking for this, uh, these things. Now, as it is right now, with an ETA in it, it's uh, by, I, I think, horological uh, uh, measure, this like, belongs in the standard category. Uh, the um, watch ranking uh, people give Chopard uh, three stars. Now, three stars is not bad, okay? It's with Rolex, Zenith, Omega, a lot of other uh, really fine watches. Something about Chopard, though, that I like, and I'm not sure what it is. Now, this particular one is uh, $1,180. Okay, for Chopard, that looks pretty decent. It's, it's part of a group called the Mili Miglia, the 1,000 miles, an Italian race. But at the bottom down there, I put a note, is that the current ones, they are now in-house Chopard movements called the 01.01-C. Okay, so Chopard has not been, you know, just sitting on its uh, laurels or reputation. Uh, they've been doing things. And I think this is why the um, foundation, the Orology, gave them the fine watchmaking seal of approval, okay, as a historic Maison. So it's not... That's not for nothing, okay? All right, so let's let's see what else they got. Uh, the next thing I went looking for in Chopard, by the way, too, it's, they've won five Grand Prix, which is no small feat. Um, they they had this one, and, and I referred to it as the uh, Chopard Classic because they now have, I mean, the, the, the new ones that are called Chopard Classic look the same. Uh, this is 18 karat white gold, and uh, it's uh, the for sale price is 1917, 1,900, oh, about 2,000 dollars. Which for a watch like this is pretty good. It's a manual wind, and instead of stainless steel, you get white gold. It's a beautiful dress watch. Um, if you look closely, you can see the band. It may be a little chingered up, and probably needs a new band. But uh, otherwise, uh, here you have something with it's part of the uh, historic maisons, and it has this strong horology. So it this is the uh, th those are, are are three brands that I that uh, that I think are worth looking into. Uh, one thing you got to be careful about, and and this is one example of that. Uh, this watch has is thirty two and a half millimeters, okay, uh, which is is relatively small by the more recent standard, but uh, my Patek Philippe, I think, is about the same. Looks great. It's it's a dress watch with a dress watch. Um, the uh, my El Ra, I think, is I think it's forty or forty-two uh, millimeters. It's a pretty a pretty good size watch, 
Uh, and so you, you can work within that. Now, uh, depending on the size of the wrist, if you have a smaller wrist, and these are, these are even better for you. But um, don't be too afraid of that uh, smaller size. The watches are coming down in sizes from everything I've seen. The, but anyhow, uh, the point is this, is that, you know, you want to look for these things. These are this sort of, I'm going to go on a continuous series of looking for these, for these gems that are affordable, that in really good hor horological watches, there's some, there's some deals out there. Okay. Well, now, uh, let me hear from you. I'd love to hear your feedback, as always, what you think. Maybe you got some ideas, uh, maybe your thoughts on Chopard or Beauvais. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on Beauvais. <laughs> it's like nobody knows it. Everybody knows the name, but nobody knows much about it. It's really funny. Or uh, Louis Vuitton. Now, these are very different. Uh, when you hear Chopard, you think of watches. When you think of Louis Vuitton, uh, you think of leather goods or something like that with all those funny little marks on it. And uh, when you think of Beauvais, you think of, oh, I heard of that. <laughs> Let's hear what you have to say. Love to see your comments. And uh, if this is an invitation to subscribe. Uh, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have you. Okay, uh, until Sunday when we have our next uh, collection review, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Outside, the art and science of watch collection.